we've had genetic testing. There's no like name for what Nova has. It affects her hearing, breathing, speech and her eating. With a child with special needs, you don't have an idea of what that future holds. I found myself looking online and the video that spoke absolute crazy amounts to me was um, a blogger called Marimart. Barcroft Studio is actually organised a little surprise, a little message. She's so cute. She's so sweet. <laughs> Nova is your standard two-year-old right now. She is full of energy, she loves to dance, she loves music, she loves the photos. And being around people. Yeah. Maybe like the life of the party. Yeah, life of the party. That's our little girl. Nova was born with a cranial facial difference. Um, currently her condition is undiagnosed. We've had genetic testing, so there's no like name for what Nova has. It affects her hearing, breathing, speech, and her eating. So that's why we have the tracheostomy and her G-tube. She has a severely reduced hearing because she has the jaw crushing her airway and, um, and the palate affecting things like speech and eating swallowing. and swallowing. Um, she is not able to do all of those things that we just naturally do ourselves. Oh, wow. And so we were just setting up Nova's feed. She's fed via a pump and a G-tube in her stomach. Good girl. Yay! And this side. Lunch time. <laughs> it seemed all normal at first, and we had an early scan that showed that she might have some facial differences, and we thought that would be quite small. We didn't get to bring Nova home for 101 days. 101, yeah. When we first left the hospital of Nova, we felt so good to be free because it felt so confined for so long, mm -hmm. but also terrifying that we might not know what we're doing. <laughs> yeah, like... This that, is on us now. We've that gotta, was great, we've though. we got to get this sorted. I think that's how all parents feel when they first go home. Yeah. Stand up. Stand up, please. Good girl. Hey. Do you want to take one of me? The biggest sort of hurdle that we've had, apart from all of her surgical procedures and going through that, is um, just a communication. Like it's been so challenging to learn a completely new language um, to be able to communicate with her. And read a book. book. She's not able to have a jaw opening wide enough because of the the small jaw. We're not able to fix her palate, which is delayed, which means her speech is delayed. delayed. Red flower. Her signing. Yeah, absolutely. Because she's signing a lot. Um, it just means that we have that communication with her and that's been so challenging because for the longest time there's been like no back and forth at all. Her signing is like increased tenfold. You can now show her one new sign and she'll repeat it straight away and almost remember it. I would say our biggest achievement was her walking. That was major because I didn't, we weren't sure if she was ever going to figure that out. When we finally got her to walk, it was like, whoa, amazing. With a child with special needs, you don't have an idea of what that future holds. And so I found myself searching online for videos um, just to sort of have an idea about what's next, what would the future hold for us and for Nova and 
um, you know, are there people out there living a life like this that are happy? And I found myself on the Barcroft TV YouTube channel. The video that spoke the most to me was a beauty blogger called Marimar. She has a hearing impairment, she has facial differences and a trachea, and she's also 21, living her best life. I mean, she has, she explains that she has hard days, but all in all, her family are supportive and she doesn't, you know, she's not brought back by this difference at all. She is just herself. So that's all I want for Nova. So, uh, Barcroft Studios actually organised a little surprise. Okay. Um, I've got a iPad. Oh, stop it! With oh. A little message. She's so cute. She's so sweet. <laughs> oh. You look so cool. She loves the camera. She loves to entertain. She loves people. So, so why would we hold her back? Yeah, why would we hold her back? We want her to feel like she can do anything. So we started Doe's Instagram probably about a year ago. I think people are quite drawn to her. Yeah, wanna, people are just naturally to drawn yeah. to her, yeah. The page has evolved over the last year. It's become more of a awareness page for people like Nova, people with facial differences and educating people that, um, like our daughter Nova, is first and foremost just another little girl, just like all other two-year-olds. I want to educate people that you don't have to be afraid to say hello to someone like Nova. You can honestly just say hi, she'll say hi back. She'll probably run up to you first and give you a giant cuddle. Do you want to go to the park, Baba? Hey. We've started to think about Nova's future and... Schooling. School um, <clears throat> and surgeries and that's sort of a little bit scary. We sort of just deal with what we've got in front of us right now. One day at a time, we'll figure it out when we come to it. I hope that we can change people's perception of normal because you know, this is our normal. It may not be your normal, and it may be different to your normal, but I just want people to see what that is for us. I went blind when I was 15 years old. Doctors have never been able to diagnose my condition. My life changed drastically. I just try to keep it in my brain that this is just how it's gonna be now. Generally, I normally just take five or six pills nightly. I have to label them differently, so each of them have their own different band on them, and that's how I can tell the difference. I think this is the way that I'm supposed to be. It's really shaped who I am. My bed corners are reinforced with pool noodles to keep me from knocking up my knees and my toes. My name is Jay. I'm 18 and I went blind when I was 15 years old. When I was younger, I kind of just lived in the hospital, basically. This is a coaster that my sister made for me. It says Soul Sister on it in Braille. In 2018, I was sick again for a couple of weeks. One day I was completely okay and the next day I was like just I was in the bathroom more than I was anywhere else. She said something was wrong, and we didn't understand what that meant. Yeah. And then... That's right, you said, oh, this time is yeah, really bad. Yeah, said something's not right. Something's not right. Mm -hmm. And then we went off to the ER, called the doctors. And she was shaking and vomiting and couldn't stop vomiting, and then she was unconscious and vomiting. I blacked out. 
When I was in the ER, they measured my, the pressures in my eyes. Generally, the pressures are supposed to be in between 12 and 22. Mine was at 84. They had to do a bedside surgery. That day, we knew something was wrong. She started to swell again. Sorry. See, I tried. Once the eye doctor came into the uh, room and took the measurement of her eye, he decided that we needed to release some of the pressure in both eyes. And him waiting for his partner to get there, he needed assistance. I am a surgical technologist, and I just said, hey, I can hold the clamp for you. I can do this. And he's like, okay, got to get it done. I said, okay, let's get it done, just cut. Let's get it, get it done. The swelling got so bad that within four hours, I was completely blind. And so they removed the orbital bones from both of my eyes to reduce the swelling. And I woke up three days later um, and I couldn't see. Especially after I went blind, nightmares got really difficult because normally after a nightmare you can wake up, but when I wake up from a night terror, I can still see my dream. Um, and usually it takes a couple blinks and getting up and moving around to get it out of my like vision, I guess is a way to say it. Well, when I was in the hospital, they didn't know if it was gonna be permanent. Never heard of anybody just not being able to see for a couple of days. They told me and I freaked out for a little bit and I like just screamed, gut-wrenching, blood-curdling scream. And then I was done. And I was like, okay, I'm over it and I immediately started using it to my advantage. <laughs> when I came home from the hospital, it was, uh, did you do the dishes? No, I can't see, sorry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> did you pick up your room? Can't, sorry, too blind. I started doing archery accidentally, actually. I was doing journalism and went to one of the archery practices at my school to take pictures. And the coach looked at me and was like, do you want to shoot? And I laughed at him. I eventually picked one up and was way better at it than I thought I was going to be. I did it for four years competitively, even after I went blind. So I take a lot of meds, like daily, um, and especially if I'm in the middle of a swell, it's just a bunch. But generally, I normally just take five or six pills nightly. Yeah, I, I have to label them differently. Um, so each of them have their own different band on them and that's how I can tell the difference. So this is Lexapro and that is registered by that band. And then I have these, which is hydroxyzine and this is, I tell that by this band. So. Doctors have never been able to diagnose my condition. I respond to the medications that would normally treat hereditary angioedema, which is why it's so peculiar that I did not come back with that particular disease. I see it as something that happened for me because if I spend the rest of my life feeling bad about what could have happened or what doctors could have done, then I'm not gonna get anywhere. And it's exhausting and I don't have time to like worry about that. The whole thing about like the other senses being super advanced is a myth. Because I thought I was gonna be Daredevil and I was completely ready for that. I was ready to take on crime. But no, I just rely on my hearing and on my smell and taste a lot more. It obviously has changed a lot because I've had to pay more attention to my surroundings and like be able to remember where I put things. And I mean, I still just kind of like toss my phone and like my keys and stuff like I can see and will be able to find it later. That's just a habit that I have yet to break. Other than that, I'm really organized. My confidence has improved. Um, and I don't know if that's just because I can't see myself, which might be quite the contributor. I can't look at other people and tell if they're like looking at me weird or if like they're lying to me when they say that I look nice. So I just kind of have to pretend in my brain that that's the way that it is. And that if I say I look good, then I do and nobody can tell me otherwise because who's gonna tell the blind girl that they're ugly, like what? Jay today is thriving. She's going to college. 
She's in a sorority. She stands up for herself a lot more than she used to. So I think her confidence has grown, her independence is growing, her zest for life is growing. Thank you. For the future, my path is already laid out. Uh, the little things I do every day are gonna, you know, adjust it here and there. But I really just want, I want something more than the regular. What I do want to do is kind of make a name for myself. So I'd like to work on my book and maybe do a podcast and get myself a little bit more out there. Since I went blind, I went from being a busybody, but now I'm just more focused on myself and getting through life because I think there's more to life than just having a nine to five and working until we die. I think there's a little bit more fulfillment in life that needs to be recognized. We were filming in the kitchen and I was like, hi hey, MTV, welcome to my crib. I use a wheelchair even though my legs work fine. If I were to stand up, there is a real chance that I wouldn't survive. I've come to terms with it, but sometimes it still hits me of, I'm in a wheelchair and I'll catch my reflection like in the side of the car or something like that and it kind of, it's devastating for a moment. My days are full of this chronic pain. But if you're gonna get a tattoo, I'm gonna feel that same exact pain that you are. I lay there and I'm the old me again. So part of my morning routine, especially after I eat, is my medications. And the first one I usually take is my antidepressant. And then to balance that, and to also help is uh, an anxiety medication. And then I just have a lot of allergies. I actually take H1 and H2 blockers. I have idiopathic peripheral autonomic neuropathy. It caused me to develop something called POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. So when I change in posture or stand up, my heart races. So for me, it goes over 200 beats per minute and it drops my blood pressure. And I drop to the floor like a stone and pass out. So even though my legs were perfectly fine, I'm technically capable of standing up or walking, but my body doesn't let me. I also you know, have chronic pain and nausea, digestive issues, headaches. It throws my whole entire body for a loop. And I've always been a pretty typical standard kid. Right before I had gotten sick, I felt a little bit off. It'll be four years, April 21st, the day that I collapsed. So that day, I remember I had a 6 p.m. shift at work. I had been on the couch and my mom was standing at the kitchen counter, the island. And I had gotten up and I was standing with my mom and I felt a little off. And a split second later, I pitched forward. And, you know, my mom could see this part of my chest almost coming out like there was something wrong with my heart and I dropped to the ground. I went straight to the ER and I spent a lot of time there and they didn't really know what to do. You know, physically it was fine and even, you know, after adjusting and sitting on the bed that they had me on, I felt technically fine. They're like, let's do one more test before we let you go. And so it's called a poor man's tilt table test. So what they do is they have you laying down, they check your heart rate and your blood pressure, they have you sit up, they check it again, they have you stand up and check it again. And my heart rate and blood pressure was increasing and dropping over 30 beats just by changing. And that told them that I had the postural or stack tachycardia syndrome, that something was wrong tachycardically. And truly almost feels like you're dying in that moment. And so there's no way to push through it. You know, I will be on the ground. There's no other way. There's nothing, you know, broken that the doctors could find. And that is why it's called idiopathic, which means they can't figure out why it happened and they probably won't. This is Grim. He's about a year old. He's a standard poodle and he is my service dog. So Grim, not only is he there <laughs> to be there for my support, you know, and anxiety and stuff, but he actually helps pull my wheelchair. So he's uh, learning how to mobility task. He honestly gave me back a piece of my life that I didn't really realize that I was missing. Because when I first got in a wheelchair, you know, I had to battle with not only accepting that that's the way that I am now, but also how people view me. People stared at me. Or when they would approach me for whatever reason, they would treat me like a child. Like I wasn't fully mentally there or just not capable. But as soon as I got grim, people started actually treating me like an adult again. I really wanted to educate able-bodied people, you know, of, of what it's like to be in a wheelchair and to break the stigma that everyone in a wheelchair is paralyzed because I'm a great example of that. My legs work perfectly fine, yet I cannot stand and walk. 
My book coming out on April 21st is called A Daughter of the Trolls and it is a young adult fantasy and I wrote it with a main character who is disabled like me. She's wheelchair bound and she has to go off on this magical adventure. The main character's name is Sparrow. So today I'm getting a Sparrow tattoo. Hello. Come in, come in. You're taking me to get my neck tattooed. What? How you feel about that? Yeah. This one's good. It's inevitable, Dad. You started it. You no, you do not. You have no choice. It's already happening. It's a done deal. Hey, look at these pictures I found. These are so cool. You're gonna love them. Oh, can you skip right there? Yeah. Oh my gosh. They're so cute. <laughs> That's a long time ago. Uh, look at that. The jump rope champion. <laughs> Remember, it was called jump rope for heart <laughs> that's how was your heart doing that <laughs> a little too ironic for my taste that was 2000, 2017 they invited me to la to walk the paint carpet it's a hard photo to look uh, at yeah, it's beautiful you remember that mm -hmm. playing basketball when i see myself as an 18 year old standing the tallest one you know out of all yeah. the girls and stuff like that it's just it's tough I've come to terms with it, but sometimes it still hits me of, I'm in a wheelchair, yeah. and I'll catch my reflection like in the side of the car or something like that, and it kind of, it's devastating for a moment. She uh, won first place in the jump rope contest. You'd think she'd be a real stallion after that, <laughs> so I, I figured she's gonna be an athlete. Swam all the time, active all the time. You can never see it coming. I can't even tell you how proud I am of who she's turned into. She is an author. All of this came together. Oh, Dominoes. it's amazing. Yeah, mm. it's really amazing to watch. Getting tattoos is obviously something I love. I'm pretty covered, but it's something that makes me feel normal, which is very strange to say. But people look at me very differently. You know, when they see my tattoos, they treat me normally. How are we doing so far? My parents are going to hate it. It went well. It felt great. <laughs> it was really good. It was a fun experience. I just want to be able to share my story, you know, and, and to be able to tell my testimony. I wanted to uh, inspire other people and to give them the confidence to wear what they want and not be worried about other people staring at them already because of the situation that they're in. I'm wearing my heart on my sleeve because this keeps me alive. Without it, I can go back into heart failure. If I'm not on this medication, I die. My condition is not curable. We just have to manage it the best we can. It's nice to detach for a couple hours. It's like Cinderella's slipper. I only get like a couple hours before I turn back into a pumpkin. I'm gonna change out my medication. I change out my cartridge, my tubing, and my pump every three days. This is where all of my stuff lives, day-to-day -day stuff. I'm Jerry. I was diagnosed with idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension and congestive heart failure. Pulmonary arterial hypertension means that the artery that goes from the lungs to the heart is really clotted. The right side of the heart gets enlarged because it's working too hard and then it starts to fail. So I am technically in right heart failure. Now it's pretty secure. I have secured it, there's nothing lifting. I get my medication out. This is still a pretty full bottle. I clean it before I insert anything into it. I twist this off. This is what goes in my pump and that's loading while I am opening my tubing. This is what it looks like before it goes in my arm. There's a needle right there. So then I hook it up like this, turn it, lock it in, and then I hit done. It's kind of crazy that I am like reliant on something that is on the exterior of my body. You rely on your organs, but like my medication keeps me alive. Having my heart essentially on the outside of my body gives me a lot of anxiety. <laughs> my condition is not curable. There's no explanation for it. We just have to manage it the best we can. 
I've always been really healthy. I would say that I was pretty average up until I was diagnosed. When I was diagnosed, they told me if I started medication immediately, then I could probably get three to five years to live. So I'm standing when he's telling me this and he's like, you shouldn't even be able to stand with how severe your heart is. You need to start treatment immediately or you're gonna die. I get pretty choked up thinking about this, finding out about my wife's condition that she was diagnosed with. I just didn't want to believe it, and I couldn't be there for her because we have uh, the two boys at home. Just felt completely helpless. From the day I checked myself into the ER to the day I was hooked up to my pump, we're talking three weeks. Look up, close your eyes. Close your eyes, please. It was really hard to adjust, especially because the line was coming out of my chest and the boys aren't old enough at this point to understand anything. So I was so nervous about them pulling it out. I was scared it was gonna fall out. I had never been sick and now I'm like super sick. I'm wearing my heart on my sleeve because this keeps me alive. Without it, after four hours, I can go back into heart failure. I'm on medication 24 hours, seven days a week. I started sharing on social media because when I was diagnosed, I was looking for somebody like me and I couldn't find a lot of them. So I wanted to be that person for other people. When I was diagnosed, I was told that if I didn't start treatment immediately, I was gonna die. After 10 months on the pump and being in the hospital six times because of infection, I started with this subcutaneous pump. It's been working really well. I also started a clinical trial and it's been really exciting so far. I wanted to be the person that showed them they could still go out and live their own lives and be normal people, even with a condition as serious as the one I'm dealing with. I'm going to take my pump off and I'm going to detach for a little bit. The benefit of doing this really is just because I hate being attached to a pump. I like not having to wear a pump all the time. I like the freedom that I feel. I feel normal again. It's like Cinderella's slipper. I only get like a couple hours before I turn back into a pumpkin. Now it's waterproof. I'm pump free, ready to go. I feel like I have come such a long way from that day in the hospital. I would have never thought that I was gonna put my toes back in the sand after being diagnosed and being told that I could die. We love the beach and I'm glad that we made it back here. I feel like it made me a lot stronger and I feel like it's really molded and shaped my personality going forward. With the clinical trial I'm on now, the future hope is that it'll be a cure, that it's gonna give me a lot of years. We've seen a lot of miracles that have happened in my body. I've survived a lot. My joke is I am a cat with nine lives, and I think I'm probably on my sixth life at this point.